I just biked around Lake Michigan. No one cares. Your Ben Jarofsky show for Thursday, August 12th is just moments away. But before we do this, we need to thank our sponsors. Sponsors like the Chicago Federation of Labor, SEIU Healthcare, Illinois, Indiana, the Chicago Teachers Union, and of course, Chicago Reader. ChicagoReader.com for all things there is to know the city of Chicago, where to go, what to do, what to eat, what to drink, what kind of pot to smoke. It's true. They talk about that too. It's Chicago Reader, ChicagoReader.com. Subscribe. And if you want to help out the Ben, uh, the ben Jarofsky show, you can. ChicagoReader.com forward slash Jarofsky. J O R A V is in victory, S K Y. Go to that site and you can help out the program by becoming a binhead. It is Thursday, August 12th, and live from my apartment and his attic, this is The Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, we welcome Yvette Simpson and making his return, WBEZ Bulldog, the one, the only, Dan Mielopoulos. your host, also a Bulldog, <laughs> Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Del Marie Thursday, and here's why. I'll tell you why, because my dear friend Del Marie Cobb, a fixture on this show, called me up about a week ago and said, hey, Ben, you want to get Yvette Simpson on your show? And I'm like, wait a minute. The Yvette Simpson? From Democracy for America? Yes. The Yvette Simpson, the former councilwoman from Cincinnati? Yes. The Yvette Simpson, the lady who trick-or-treated Rom on the George Stephanopoulos show? That Yvette Simpson? Yes. I'm like, yeah, we want Yvette Simpson on our show. So wheeling and dealing was done. Emails exchanged, phone calls made. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to say I'm looking at Yvette Simpson right now. Hey, ben ben, Simpson, welcome you? to the show. I'm so glad to be here. I love that trick or treat line. You might hear me repeat that in public <laughs> sometimes. I love that. <laughs> you know what? Feel free to use it. You don't even have to give me credit. Okay. Now, what do we call what I do to Chris Christie then if I'm trick or treating Ron? What am I doing to Chris Christie? That must be. Uh, we'll, we'll think about it. We'll think about it. Tricking and treating. You got. <laughs> yeah. I'm, listen, this is me talking out of Evans about George Stephanopoulos. Come on, man. Devils two, you pick one or the other. Just <laughs> one or the other. The two of them? Come on, man. <laughs> Sorry of that. You gotta trouble. know something about me. I've Double been ripping trouble. Rom since he uh, moved to Chicago to become our mayor, but that's a whole other story we're not going into. It. But that little clip that Dennis played at the outset was Mayor Rahm from uh, an exchange with you where you were advocating sensibly for Medicare for All, and Rahm started talking about his bike ride that he took around Michigan that nobody cares about, and he goes, nobody wanted to talk about Medicare for All. Yeah, because everybody was running away from you, Rahm. <laughs> nobody wanted to talk to you. <laughs> uh, that is so fun. I love y'all already. We're going to have so much uh, fun today. I yes, we are. So, Yvette, first of all, uh, shout out to Del Marie. And the reason, mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that you're on the show is that uh, you're going to be her guest of honor at her next Ida Legacy. So before yeah. any further ado, tell folks uh, it is August 19th, I believe. I'm looking at my notes. I can barely read my writing of it. August 19th at uh, an Italian restaurant, Truth Italian Restaurant, 56 East Pershing Road. Tell folks a little bit about uh, what you're going to be talking about. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for having me. I feel delighted, privileged, honored that I get to take this space with you. What you guys do is brilliant, creating space for people like me to talk and certainly Del Marie. So thank you. And I'm excited to be coming to Chi-Town uh, next week to do this amazing talk with Ida's Legacy, which is an organization that really promotes, as you know, um, progressive politics, progressive issues, um, and particularly through the racial lens, race and gender. And uh, I love that. And I love that they've chosen me to come and talk at such a crucial time in our country's history when we talk about these issues. And so I'm going to be talking um, myself and, and either Del Marie or a reporter are going to be engaging in a conversation, an interview, if you will, about all the big hot topics um, that we need to know about, both those that affect Chicago, which, you know, Chicago is the heart of our nation uh, and what affects the world, 
affect Chicago probably first or second. Uh, and we will also be talking about uh, just big picture. What is it that we need to and can do um, to improve the state of our country for the people who need us most, which is what progressives do. Absolutely. So uh, August 19th, 2021, mm-hmm. Ida's Legacy, uh, probably bring Del Marie on the show to promote it as well. She's a regular yeah. on the show, as everybody knows, one of our most popular guests. Uh, all right, uh, Yvette, let's talk about politics in America. And um, on, uh, I always call it the George Stephanopoulos show. I know it has a real name, but I always forget it. But I just You're always closest it- this week with George Stephanopoulos, but you got it. Yeah, I got the main part about it. Uh, um, So the role that you often are required to play on that show is the one that most of my listeners can really uh, groove on, if you will. And that is the lefty. You're talking to lefties out here. Mm -hmm. I mean, they like to nationwide to call progressives, but the the word has been so sullied of that. I don't even know what it means anymore. Uh, So that's the role you have to play and the role that Iran plays is one that comes really easy to him always telling lefties to shut up and move back and don't push too hard don't embarrass me it's like a parent no a kid talking to a parent in an elevator don't say anything you're going to embarrass me so (laughs) what how far and how deep do you take this of that this notion that somehow or other people who extol the worldview that you extol are detrimental to the Democratic Party. It's ridiculous. I mean, the reality is, and I just talked about it on the show last Sunday for those of your listeners who got to listen to it, this idea that the base of the Democratic Party is moderate, um, which for me means, you know, slow down, don't change, um, you know, and that the moderate base of the party is right now, that it, it... What happened, we were talking about Ohio 11 and the fact that there was Trump Republican money in the Democratic primary, and they teamed up with corporate Democrats to take down a progressive and how proud they were of that when progressives are literally saving everybody, um, which is what the Democratic Party used to be about. So, you know, I think it's foolishness. I think what's happened is a big part of our party is sold out to the same corporate interests that we see Republicans taking, which is why they've frozen, can't make real change, don't want to make real change. And it leaves progressives, lefties like us, to take care of everybody else. They want to continue to push this narrative that for some reason we're radical and out of this world because we want people to be healthy, whole, and lead their best life. Um, I'm sorry, that's not radical. That's just called what it is. And that's what we should all be about. And we are trying our best, as you know, because you're a brother in the struggle too, Ben. We are trying to bring this crazy party back to its soul. Um, but they're so sold out, it's nearly impossible. When you see, at a, I'm at a table with Rahm Emanuel, Chris Christie, and usually Sarah Isker or a different Sarah who represents the Republican flank of the party. Help me understand how Rahm Emanuel agrees with Chris Christie more than he agrees with me, a black woman who is a leader in the movement that is a part of his party, which is frankly the present and the future of the Democratic Party. It's nuts. It's well, nuts, first of, and I can talk about it all day. All right. Well, let's <laughs> let's go there a little bit. Uh, yes. Because it, it, it actually doesn't matter what Rahm Emanuel really thinks. Uh, so I was going to say, do you really think he believes the stuff that he says? So that's, that's neither here nor there. Uh, the reality is that he represents a viewpoint that feels as though all the progressive ideas that for lack of a better, I'm just going to link them with Bernie for the moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. That Bernie has been extolling, Bernie Sanders has been extolling for the last four years or so uh, are detrimental to the future of the democratic party. You cannot win swing States with those ideas. You cannot win suburban districts in Wisconsin and Maryland and Pennsylvania, et cetera, with those. It's, and I want to know how much, like, do you believe, have you internalized that, Yvette? You know what I'm saying? Like, are you one of the, are you one of those lefties that goes, yeah, maybe he has a point and you get a little embarrassed when you, like Nina Turner just comes out and says what she thinks. Do you, have you internalized it in any way? Oh, no. I mean, because it's real for me. Like the people that I fight for every single day is the, the leader of Democracy for America, the, the progressive champions that we seek to elect. That's the kind of change we want them to make. I'm sold out. I'm not playing a role. This is who I am. This is who I've always been. You know, I got into this work because I wanted to make real change for real people. And so I think they're pushing a narrative because they want people to believe it. The reality is, is progressives can win everywhere. Here's why. Because progressive values are American values. 
They are bipartisan in their nature. Washington has not figured that out. They're trying to get together this crazy infrastructure bill that ain't gonna really help nobody for real to get Republicans and Democrats together when the reality is, is most Americans think we should be doing more. Most Republicans think we should be doing more who are on Main Street the folks up in Washington can't seem to figure that out. So no, I'm definitely not believing that. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm quite disappointed and frustrated with our party to be pushing that narrative because we used to be the party of the people. We used to be the party that prioritized people. Now they're all standing in the line for those fat checks from big pharma, big oil. And guess what? They're bowing down. They're beholden to all of these interests, which happen to be detrimentally and diab uh, diabolically, they Damn. are opposed Mm -hmm. Too many D's. They're opposed mm -hmm. to our interests. Yeah. You know, and so let's be clear. I am 100% sold out um, that we need to band together against those interests. It's not even about left and right anymore. It's about the haves and the have nots at this point. And so what progressives are trying to do is trying to represent that. Well, one of the conversations we have a lot on the show and we turn away from a local news and talk about national news is the whole issue of how uh, Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer uh, should get their, well, like a, a, a real Democratic infrastructure bill through the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody pretty much comes on this show. Uh, it denounces the filibuster and is uh, exhorting uh, Manchin and Cinema, Senators Manchin and Cinema, just to jump aboard and be Democrats. And they want Joe Biden and Schumer to somehow or other get that 50 together and the hell with the Republicans. And that's where people on this show, and I'm talking guests, guests, listeners, <laughs> hosts, pretty much everybody, how real do you think that is as a possibility? Because it seems like the world that I live in does not replicate the world that I read about in the Washington Post and the New York Times when it comes to Washington politics. Go ahead, but You can't be a progressive without being an optimist. I say it all the time because you can't be in this position without believing that the world can get better and that people can change. Uh, Angela Davis said, you have to believe that you can radically transform the world and you have to believe it all the time. And so as a true uh, lefty progressive, I believe uh, that things can happen. Now, my practical side, my realistic side says that Biden doesn't want it to change, so it's not going to change. And he can scapegoat all of his other, if he really wants to do it, it will happen. We have not yet heard him say, the, the chief uh, leader of the, the free world, say that voting rights is important enough that we should end the bill buster. That alone should be the conversation. This issue should be enough. He's also not willing to say as the leader of the dominant party in our country that we should actually have control. Why did you decide that you want to be a president if you are gonna just give it away? So he has the power to actually decide that we're not gonna be under minority rule. That all the work that we've done over the last four years to actually bring these bills up in the house that we're gonna to try to find a way to make sure that they see the light of day. And we're gonna make real change. I think, you know, this is my challenge to Biden, and it always has been. You can be Washington as usual, which you've been trying to do this job for longer than I've been alive. He's been in politics longer than I've been alive. This is your swan song, sir. You can decide whether you want to be a transformative president like FDR, who he likes to hold up, or if you want to be Washington as usual. If you're going to be Washington as usual, you could have stayed in the Senate for all that. Stay with your buddies, wrestle with them down there. But if you decide you want to take the big seat, then now you've got to be the one to push the needle for real change. This is your moment, sir. Who do you want to be? How do you want history to remember you? And what I worry about with Biden is that he's just kind of a vanilla guy. You know, 10 and 1, let's meet in the middle at 5. But the <laughs> reality is, is that ain't helping nobody. And I, I hate the word moderate because moderation is a privilege. It's a luxury that we can't afford. If you got enough money in your pocket that you can wait for change, if you got enough money in your pocket that you can take a spaceship to space while the rest of us are down here on fire, you can afford moderation. 99% of the people, the people that we fight for, me and you, Ben, they can't wait for change. Forget moderation. It's time for us to pump up the volume and go full speed for the people who really need it. All right, I'm going to run uh, something past you, which I call uh, the Monroe Anderson theory, and it's named for an old friend of Delmarie and mine who comes on the show uh, every Wednesday, a longtime journalist in the city of Chicago. I don't know if you ever had the pleasure to meet him, Monroe Anderson, and he is usually occupying the, he's sort of our centrist, although he always gets mad at me from saying it because he says he's practical. All right, so Monroe, you know, I love you, but you're kind of our centrist. And Monroe is saying 
uh, that there's a grand strategy uh, to Joe Biden that I've been, the lefty, refused to recognize. So follow me in this event. Uh, there's a grand strategy, and at some point, Joe Biden is going to call me. <laughs> I haven't even gotten through extol. I haven't got through describing the Monroe theory, and that's already shaking her head. So, uh, so at some point, uh, Joe Biden is going to call Mansion and Cinema Senators Mansion and Cinema into his office and said, "Look, the reality is, I tried, but the, you can't deal with these Republicans. So we're going to have to end the filibuster for fill in the blanks." Uh, voting rights legislation or statehood for Washington, D.C., for good God's sake, you know, uh, or fill in the blank, whatever it is, uh, maybe uh, a budget matter. Uh, and they're going to have to go along. Do you uh, subscribe to the Monroe theory? Do you think this is part of uh, a grand play by a wise uh, chess player who's like three steps ahead of Ben in his attic? Go ahead. I do not. My <laughs> Angelo said, uh, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. You know, this man is a man who has been, he's not um, complex. He's not nuanced. Uh, you know, he's, he's Scranton PA. Uh, it is what it is. And, mm -hmm. and this man has shown us over the course of his career who he is. The war in Iraq, the crime bill, Anita Hill. He is, he is a guy who knows what he wants and he goes straight at it. He is not a political mastermind, at least in my book. I don't expect it. I think that he hopes that he can skate through 2022 and 2024 right down the middle. He wants to take that middle lane. He's not like those of us who are trying to skate left and right, trying to you know make sure we're actually looking good, spinning around, making everybody happy. He just wants to float through this, through this middle lane and hopefully walk through unscathed. He does not want to upset the apple cart. And it goes back to that first fundamental issue, money and politics. Who does he work for? Do you work for us or do you work for the people? He does not want to rock the boat. So I don't see him doing that. I don't see him doing that. Now we are mounting a significant amount of pressure in the progressive wing of the party again to make it real hard. I mean, folks are, are, are protesting every week. We're doing marches, people getting arrested. We've even got more moderate folks, I think, on our side right now um, against what Manchin and Cinema are about. I mean, like Chuck Schumer's in a press conference talking about canceling student loan debt. I, I had to rub my eyes. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, is this what I think it is? Um, so it's an interesting thing. I think, I think his calculation is always how do I, Biden's calculation is how do I get maximum credit without having to do very much effort. How do I How do I not make a bunch of people mad? And so people said, do you think that Joe Biden wakes up in the morning and thinks, I wonder what the progressive wing of the party thinks of me today? Or I, I wonder if Yvette Simpson, no, I don't think he does. But I do think he wakes up and says, oh my God, I hope the progressive wing of the party doesn't embarrass me today. And if that's the way we have to motivate him, then that's the way we, I think he has a, a real fear about what we might do to his reputation, how we might move. I think this Corey Bush thing blew his mind. I think he's like, oh my God. But I don't think he's waking up thinking what's on a vet's list, what's on the progressive <laughs> list, and how can I make it happen? So it's going to take a huge amount of pressure, I think, to move him because I think his natural inclination is to do very little and try not to upset as many people and to say he did a lot more than he actually did. All right. Uh, let's make a little bit of a transition, and although it's related. Uh, and I'm re uh, reading from the press release that Delmarie sent out about some of the things you're going to be talking about. Uh, and this is actually a topic we have on this show uh, many times with uh, many different of our guests. And I'm just quoting from the press release. Being a black progressive often put... By the way, I hand wrote this, so I can barely read my own writing of that. <laughs> oh, so smooth on we'll, the Ben Drusco. Being we'll a black work it out. Yeah, we'll work it out, as the uh, Beatles used to say. Being a black progressive often puts you in the place where you're battling everybody. I did actually read my word. Uh, yeah. This whole idea of decentering whiteness and centering in black uh, voices and black experience is so important for us to talk about. Uh, and that is a very uh, powerful statement and something we talk about on the show a lot. Just uh, the inability of the left, the white left, if you want to call it, for lack of a better word, the Bernie left, my beloved Bernie, uh, to get black voters to vote for them. And uh, this is a, a constant theme on our show, uh, Yvette. And you put it, being a black progressive often puts you in a place where you're battling everybody. Why don't you, I don't want, I don't want you to give away too much of what you're going to say, August 19th. Okay. Del Marie would go, Ben, come on now. I got to get people in that room. But just explain a little bit what you're talking about. 
so I took over as the first black woman ever to lead Democracy for America. And when I came in, there were a lot of leaders like me that were being asked to come and lead traditional white progressive organizations. And the challenge with that is one, the progressive movement is beautiful, right? Like we love to take care of people. We're on the right side of issues, healthcare, student loan debt, all of this stuff, we're, we're here. But we forget whiteness and white supremacy is in our own institutions, right? The centering of whiteness, which makes it difficult for us to relate to the black voter. Black voters are relational. They want to know you. They're not transactional. Uh, they want to know you. Are you with me? Um, you know, when was the last time you came and stopped by my house? Uh, can I really trust you? And I think there are times when our movement, white and progressive, likes to do what white people do, tell black people what they need. Tell us what, how to do it. Let me save you. We don't need white saviors. What we need is strong allies who will step out of the way, move aside, and center the voices and the concerns of Black people in this movement. Because progressive does not equal just white. This movement is very brown. And the principles about this movement are very brown. You think about Martin Luther King was, was a Black progressive who led on the very issues that we're fighting for now. You know, fair wages, making sure everybody has health care. These are all things that are rooted in the Black struggle, in the Black civil rights history and movement. We just need our white counterparts to, rem to remember that like we're here and like we don't have to be the first and the last person talking. We don't need you to descend upon our communities and try to fix it. We need you to center Black activists, Black leaders, Black people, hear from them about what they need and be helpful. Get out the center. And so there's a lot of patriarchy and there's a lot of white supremacy that exists in progressive spaces. And it's one of the reasons why we've not been able to, to your point, to break through to black voters because there's a lack of trust because you're coming just like every other person. You don't know me. You kind of tell me what I need. Listen and, and elevate me and let me be the center. And so as a leader in this organization and in this movement, I find myself battling with my own co-leaders to say, I love you and also sit down. Mm -hmm. Just be quiet and listen. Um, and to remind us when we make those moves, you know, white progressives can be Karens and Chads. I've seen them do it. Um, we need to not be those people. And we also need to make sure that we're not projecting whiteness into a space that is supposed to be multicultural. So get out of the way and let us do it. Is there something when you <laughs> when you look at what uh, what how Bernie Sanders ran in 2016 and 2020? Uh, is there anything specific that you could say if he had done X Y Z, he might have done better with black voters, or if he had not done X Y Z, he might have done better with white uh, black voters? I think he would have had to do it long before because of the relational nature of black you know commitment. So Biden did what he had to do. He played the Obama card. He's like, Obama's my best friend. Let's show some pictures of us running next to the White House with a dog. Like, we're fist bumping. He played the card, and Black people know Barack. They trust Barack, and he played that card. Now, I think a lot of Black folk wasn't really feeling Biden 100%, but he had, he had the Barack card. And with Bernie, Bernie's saying all the things that make sense to us, all the issues, but we don't know you like that. Like, where you been? You, you weren't at the cookout. You weren't playing cards, uh, bid whiz with us last week. We don't know you. So I think he has to embed himself into the black community because he's, he's a white guy coming from Burlington, Vermont. And honestly, that's where our headquarters is too. So big up to Burlington, Vermont. <laughs> but he has to also realize that, that he comes across and he is, you know, Bernie's a great leader. He's, he's one of the most pitch perfect, consistent voices. Bernie's been saying the same thing for 30 years. He's one of the most, that's what I love about him. And also, you need to make sure that you're in black spaces and that decentering yourself, that decentering yourself is very, very important. And I know that's hard for Bernie to do. I think it's hard for a lot of traditional white progressive leaders to do where you step aside and say, look, I don't profess to know everything you need. I'm here to serve you. Why don't you take the microphone? Tell us what you need. <laughs> do that uh, yeah. and build that relationship. And I think and we need to do that as a movement. I mean, we need to stop race to race jumping in the black community saying, vote for me. And we and build those long-term relationships so that when it's time for us to come and actually help make real change for people, they trust us to do it because it's all about trust. And so my takeaway from what you just said is that uh, the biggest uh, stumbling block for Bernie was that he was maybe 15 years too late. Maybe. You know what I'm saying? 
Like if he had started doing this in 2000, it might have been a different story. Uh, because I really wrestle. And I say I'm older than you, Yvette, so I remember these things. And Del Marie knows what I'm going to say right now if she's listening. Uh, and she probably is. Del Marie was a campaign uh, spokesperson for Jesse Jackson, Jesse Lewis Jackson, his 1988 presidential run. And Del Marie knows what I'm going to say. He was where Bernie was. 30 years before Bernie was there. Jesse Jackson's campaign was so left. I got so many people come on the show and go, Ben, you don't understand. Well, the black voter is far more conservative uh, than you. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I just know, I remember like 80 to 90% of black voters that voted for Jesse Lewis Jackson, and he was talking about health care for all, Yvette Simpson, in 1988, okay? He would be going to Iowa and talking about white farmers needing assist, better assistance because big agra is taking over. I mean, these were lefty views of that Simpson yeah. back in 1988. So people tell me that blacks are more conservative. I just think there's a, a disconnect that you're getting at. That's a lazy take. That's a lazy take. I think, um, I think black voters want to be with a winner. I think they worry about taking a chance on somebody who might lose. But black voters are not conservative. The issues, I mean, because we see it in our communities. We say when, when white America gets a cold, black people get, a, get the flu. And we need and want real change. We just don't believe it. And that's why I think Jack, Jack, uh, Jackson was able to, to really galvanize that and get people to believe that we could have that kind of change. It's the same idea we have with, with Reverend Barber right now with the Poor People's Campaign and the way he's galvanizing that message, what Martin Luther King was about, as you know, working with labor unions, trying to get fair wages for people, trying to make sure people had everything they need. And let's be clear, Martin Luther King didn't like white moderates. He talked about it. <laughs> he was not a fan. Um, so this movement needs to make room for everybody. And you're right. I think Jesse Jackson shows that black progressivism is not new. We're not new to this. We're true to this. And what we need to do is have our white allies counterparts to acknowledge that and not act like, bring the white savior complex into the conversation all the time. All right. Uh, let's move away from the uh, Democrats for a moment and uh, close by talking about MAGA which is mm. out of its freaking mind. Mm. And uh, I'm not a big Twitter person. In fact, the joke is I never look at Twitter at all, but prepare for this show. I looked at your Twitter feed and you had one line in there. Uh, you had a link to, um, oh boy, what's his name uh, from Kentucky? Rand Paul. Mm -hmm. the, Rand Paul, and you had a picture. And I want you to go on and riff on this a little bit about Simpson. You had a picture of Rand Paul getting the shot. It was not COVID. It was it was a Hep C shot. The same idea. He does believe oh. in vaccine. Oh, isn't that it? Okay, you got one. <laughs> so we don't have actual picture from getting the COVID shot. All right. No. Uh, so talk about MAGA. MAGA is doubling down on this. Yeah. They're, this they're going all. They're going. Uh, the governor uh, DeSantis of uh, Florida, Governor Abbott in Texas, they're going after any municipality, any locale, look. Uh, local mayor or county commissioner uh, who dares to implement a mask mandate and they're passing, trying to pass state laws that ban you from doing that. They are doubling down on dumb. They are I, doubling I, down on dumb. Yes. <laughs> that is exactly right. They are. You, and the hypocrisy is real. I mean, a good number of Senate Republicans have already had the vaccine. Heck, Trump not only got the good drugs when he was in the hospital, <laughs> to cure him of COVID, but he was first in line in January to get himself a vaccine. And, and they're telling all these people, like, don't get vaccinated when you did. And so that was the funny thing about Rand Paul, who we don't have a picture of him getting the vaccine. I don't, I'm not sure if he's one of the Senate Republicans who's had, who has, but I've heard that he is. But we had a picture of him getting a vaccine a couple of years ago, so we decided to use that because he's not anti-vaccine. You know what I mean? Like, is this about the government shouldn't tell you whether, whether you should have a vaccine or not? It's not. So I think the, the challenge is Republicans have doubled down on dumb, not just on this issue, but on every issue. They are counting on the fact that people who are listening to them are listening blindly and they will do whatever they're told. What I don't get, though, is what is the long term political strategy for killing off your entire base of voters? I don't get how that serves you, because the reality is, is if we continue to allow these people to be manipulated and do, they will not survive. You know what I mean? That is a harsh way to de demonstrate natural selection. We don't want people to die because they're being fed bad information. So we've been con continually trying to remind people that you're, you're following a group of people who are telling you to do something 
that they won't do themselves or do you, not to do something that they've already done. Do you think this message uh, that the, the Republicans are putting out uh, will uh, influence other voters? And let me just explain. I talked about this yesterday. I'll bring it to you. Uh, there's a comedian, you probably DL Hewley, and I follow his mm -hmm. Instagram feed. He's very funny and he's very lefty. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so he he's very pro vaccine. He's always putting stuff on vaccine. And I, I read the response. And uh, Avet, you got to see it to believe it. It's like at least half his respondents are black people saying, DL, I'm, I'm ready to drop you. You've gone too far. Stop shaming. Like he had this, he made fun of this couple and they were wearing a great, a make America great hat. And they were talking about the, he's <laughs> sorry to laugh. And they're make, talking about how God can cure you of COVID. You just need fresh air. And the, the people responding were like, stop trying to shame them just because they're wearing uh, MAGA hats. And I'm like, are these real people or is are these Russian bots or I don't know. You know, you never know when you get on Instagram. My point is, how deep do you think the Republican rhetoric about not trying to force people to get the vaccine? How deep do you think that goes uh, into the American uh, electorate as a whole? I don't think it goes far in the across the entire American um, electorate. I think. Um, I thought there were like 10 or 12 people who were um, QAnon people who believe in QAnon conspiracy. We found out that one in four Republicans actually support QAnon conspiracy. So it's a lot more than we thought. I think there is a base of Republican folks who have been duped and who believe. The rest of us, we can see it and we know. I think, and I talked about this on the show Sunday, Black hesitancy around the vaccine has nothing to do with political we don't care, right? It's not about that. It's about distrust in general for government and for medical professionals. That's where I feel like I have to talk to my brothers and sisters to say, and also you could die from COVID. You're more likely to die from that. So let's talk to your doctor about the risk and get that figured out. It's, it's white Americans and particularly white Republicans and far uh, right Republicans who have been like literally are, are parroting every single thing that they're hearing, watching their family members die, watching their folks get sick and still not believing to your response about the God will save us. Somebody said, well, then why do you need guns? <laughs> you seem to need a gun to protect your household, but you don't need a mask. Like God can save you from that, too. So it's all hypocritical. It doesn't make sense. You know, and, and, and you know, I don't know how what people or your leadership feel about God or believe in God. But if, if you could imagine a God who's sitting here like, you idiot, <laughs> who do you think brought you the vaccine and the mask? Put it on yeah. um, and do it. So I think there is this, my, my fear is that, that there are more of them than we know. But I don't think, and, 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 and that's been confirmed time and time again. Um, and, but I don't think that the broad electorate, I mean, you think about how many people have already gotten vaccines, how many people are ready for a booster when we're ready, how many people actually follow the guidelines. You've got a group of really, really extreme people who are, um, who are, uh, are, are doubling down. And you know what makes me worried then? It's kind of got a handmaid's tale feel to it. Like it's real creepy. I'm kind of wishing I hadn't seen that show. There's something about this group of people that has a mindset and they know that these people are vulnerable to hearing and believing these things. And my fear is that these are some of the same people who threaten to overthrow the government. These are some of the other people who believe that my life doesn't matter, that my vote doesn't matter as a black American, who want the world to go back to the way it was in the Confederacy, who want slavery to happen again, who want women to be barefoot and pregnant and not have real options and choices and to stay at home. And that's my fear. I don't know how deep and wide that goes. I think there's a lot of folks in the South and the not so South. I don't want to stereotype the South, but even in other places in the not so South who actually believe that, that that's ingrained in them. Oh, yeah, I know there's a lot of people in Chicago, believe me, Yvette, who believe that stuff too. Mm. Uh, I've been living in the city for a long time. Uh, Yvette Simpson, thank you so much. One more time, everybody. August 19th, 2021. Uh, she will be 2020. I gave the date, the year. Good God. Uh, she'll be at Truth Italian Restaurant, 56 East Pershing Road. 
uh, for Ida's Legacy, our good friend Delmarie Cobb's organization does outstanding work. Uh, just so, um, Yvette Simpson, thank you very much for taking the time thank you for uh, having to talk me. to me. And now that you've uh, been on the show once, I'm going to, I got that press secretary of yours, Madison White. I'm looking at her right now. Probably yeah. going to reach out to her in about a month to bring you back. All right. Anytime. I love what you're doing. Thank you for giving voice uh, to our, our issues and our world. We need something to counteract the crazy Fox News cycle. So we just appreciate you doing that, speaking truth to power uh, and giving place for people like me uh, to talk to your listeners. I appreciate it. Anytime. All right. Very good. Thank you so much, Yvette. Uh, Danny Mialopoulos will be joining us in just a moment. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back with da young Daniel. We'll be talk to you soon. Back to the Ben Jarofsky show live from his attic. Yes, this is uh, always that moment of the show, a little panic on the uh, this old baby boomers part as we reach out to another guest, young Daniel. Danny Malopoulos goes, where is it? He's calling me. I'm like, Do you think there's any other host in the world? All right, get it out. Get it out. He's here. Doorbell. Oh, there's young Daniel. There he is. Danielopoulos. All right, our time is limited with this young man because he has a very important interview to do in about 20 minutes or so. So, Dan, thank you very much for coming on the show. I've been bugging you for the last two weeks to come on, and we're not going to waste time talking about basketball, okay, or soccer. We're not going to – that's just show discipline and patience right now, young Dan. Dan Mielopoulos from WBEZ uh, comes on the show. We talk basketball sometimes, sports sometimes, but he's here today uh, in his role as investigative reporter for BEZ, and he has done a fantastic job, in my humble opinion. And I think all the reporters in the city of Chicago take a moment and thank Dan for doing a great job breaking stories uh, about the what I call burying of evidence by the Chicago Park District, uh, the mayor of Chicago in Chicago, and my beloved hometown, Evanston. My beloved hometown, Evanston, that likes to pretend it's this bastion of liberalism and open-minded attitudes toward everything, bearing evidence as well about horrific, like the whole mentality of lifeguards, this like frat boy mentality of lifeguards. So Dan, that's just sort of like the general statement of what you've been doing, how, how, have you been dedicating your hours of your life uh, to this important topic? Why don't you break it down and talk? Let's talk about Chicago first before we get to Evanston. I don't even know if we're going to get to Evanston because Chicago is so horrific. It starts in February of 2020 with a complaint that was sent to the Park District. Uh, Mike Kelly, the leader of the Park District, take it from there, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, we've been covering, like you said, twin uh, scandals involving uh, allegations of harassment, abuse, assault against lifeguards in Chicago and north of Howard Street at the Six Beaches in Evanston. And it all started in Chicago, at least from the public's awareness of what was going on. 
for more than a year, uh, there were complaints and there was an inspector general's investigation moving along in complete secrecy at the Chicago Park District. And that ended, that secrecy was broken in April of this year when we obtained uh, a series of investigative reports that were given to the Chicago Park District Board headed by former Rich Daly Press Secretary Avis Lavelle. And this revelation uh, showed that the accusations are very, very serious, uh, including sexual misconduct against minors, and that it largely involved supervisors at the beaches uh, you called it, I think, a, a frat house atmosphere. Some have called it an old boys club. In any sense, um, it was a toxic work environment for many, many women who have alleged uh, that they've suffered from sexual violence and sexual harassment in their jobs at either beaches or pools that are public um, aquatics department uh, facilities under the Chicago Park District. All right, and let's just uh, get this timeline straight. Uh, this is very important, folks. If you take nothing away from this conversation with Dan, it's this basic timeline. February 7th, I believe, is uh, 2020. 2020, folks, okay? Uh, a complaint was sent to Mike Kelly, this appointee. You said he was a daily appointee or Rom? I think daily appointed him originally, right? And then Rom seconded, or was it the other way around? Rom appointed it. Well, no, Mike Kelly is the CEO and general superintendent of the Park District. He's been with the Park District since uh, Rich Daly's administration. Daly. But he's okay. been in this position leading the agency uh, since Rahm appointed him about 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, the timeline is very important. I mean, we can tick through it very quickly uh, and make our point here that, that it looks like Mike Kelly did not act immediately, did not act as uh, he was – saying that he would do at the time but february 7th a female lifeguard very young uh files a complaint um and alleges all sorts of hazing and all sorts of abuse in her job uh mostly at oak street beach a couple of years ago mike kelly writes back to her within hours uh he apparently knows her father uh and writes back to her within hours and says um this is really serious and you have a lot of courage, um, and we're going to heed your call for change. I'm going to give it to the inspector general. Mike Kelly then does not give it to the inspector general, we now know, until March 19th of 2020. So February 7th, the complaint comes in. Same day he promises to give it to the inspector general. Does not happen until March 19th, 2020. And he has now publicly acknowledged that in some interviews with other reporters, not named Dan Mihalopoulos. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that, that is the of, of initial complaint against Mike Kelly. And now we can also talk about why this is stretched on now for close to a year and a half. The inspector general says they lack the resources. Uh, we don't think the park district has given them more resources as far as we know. The mayor has said that it's not an issue of resources and has resisted efforts to have the city's own inspector general join the effort of the park district inspector general. And so, you know, the question is, have they dealt with this immediately as they said they did? It appears the facts would contradict Mike Kelly's story. Have they dealt with it as aggressively and with as many resources as they could devote to it? Um, they have not. All right, so this is one more time, folks. This is what you got to take away. February 2020, the complaint comes in. Mike Kelly immediately responds to the complaint and says, I am going to immediately send this to Inspector General for investigation because this is really important. These allegations of these of, of harassment going on at Oak Street Beach, this lifeguard mentality where it's just like they, the, the men lifeguard think they could just like uh, – use uh, the women life guys that are little toys or whatever. He does nothing. He said he was going to turn it over. He doesn't turn it over. It's like he moves on with his day. March 19th, he turns it over. Uh, it, But there's a reason for that. It took him six weeks 
a second complaint came in. Am I correct in that, Dan, that there was a second complaint that came in and that right. motivated him finally to turn over the first complaint? Do I have that correct? You do have the timeline correct. February 7th, he gets the first complaint, says the same day he's going to send it to the inspector general. Next month, Mayor Lori Lightfoot's office gets a separate complaint of even more disturbing allegations sent from another lifeguard as far as we know doesn't know the first one who complained the second complaint is forwarded from the mayor's office to kelly's office and then very promptly both of those complaints are forwarded to the inspector general and they trigger the investigation which continues now what is it 16 months later okay so let's just pause in your humble opinion, or forget your opinion, based on what Mike Kelly has said, why did it take him six weeks to do what he would, what he said he would do right away? He said, I'm going to send this over right now. And then he didn't send it over right now. He probably would not have sent it over, this is me speaking, at all if he hadn't get that second complaint from the mayor. Why the delay, Dan? What is his explanation for that? He's never explained it to me. I, I noticed this six week gap and I reported on it in April when we first disclosed the existence of the investigation and the fact that certain lifeguards had actually been investigated and, and, and forced out of the um, park district because of this. Um, we've been asking ever since then. He won't answer to us. Then uh, last week um, when we and the Chicago Sun-Times report on the, the response that he gave to the young woman, um, telling her that, that he would have given it to, to the inspector general. Uh, and, and again, questions are raised about the six week discrepancy. Uh, he still doesn't call me back. I still don't get an answer from the park district or from the mayor who I asked, by the way, last week. Suddenly though, we see Mike Kelly is doing a media tour. Uh, he's doing interviews at, with various television stations. I think, you know, two, five and seven if memory serves, as well as possibly our colleague Craig Delamore from WBBM Radio, which is his prerogative. But it's also um, my opportunity now to pick apart what he claimed to these reporters. I, I don't know what follow-up questions they did or did not ask him, but he claims that he did take immediate action. You know, he, did, he admits he didn't send it to the inspector general. He admits he said he was going to send it to the inspector general. I mean, that's an email. We have the receipts. But what he says is that he mentioned it to some other managers and thought he would deal with it internally until the second complaint came. And then he said, well, well, maybe we should send this to the inspector general after all. Who are these managers that he gave it to? What investigation did they do? Again, I've asked the park district this week, no answers. Uh, they have not provided any proof, despite dozens of Freedom of Information Act requests to them. They've not provided any proof that there was any sort of investigation internally that went on uh, of the first complaint until after the second complaint went to the mayor's office and then to his office, and finally both went to the inspector general. Uh, there is a code that says that if you're aware of uh, serious misconduct that you have to, uh, you know, deal with it and and pass it on. And that did not happen uh, for 41 days. I, uh, I see many parallels to the Anjanette Young case here. Uh, when you've had Anjanette Young on as a guest in the show, we've talked about her case many times. Uh, this is uh, the woman whose home uh, was uh, invaded by police officers who had uh, the wrong address on a no-knock warrant, and she was naked. Uh, and uh, they, they searched her house, and it was essentially hum humiliation. Uh, it, it was compounded by the, the lack of attention from the mayor's office to put it mildly uh my takeaway when i look at the fact that uh, mike kelly did nothing for six weeks uh and probably who knows if they would have done anything at all if you hadn't gotten onto the story uh in april of 2021 my takeaway is at the very least there's indifference uh strong indifference on the parts of the powers that be in the city of chicago at the park district and at city hall um to this evidence of harassment against women. Do you think I'm being unfair uh, to the powers that be in Chicago? 
No, I think that there are a number of people, including former lifeguards, who say they were abused, who completely uh, would agree with you and who have told me that they, they agree with you. And, and I think you'll be hearing more from some of them uh, in our reporting shortly. Um, you know, Mike Kelly also said that he, he knew the father of the first complainant and had a conversation with him, called him an acquaintance. Uh, so I, I don't know if he thought that uh, perhaps if he placated uh, the father, but you know, that's all speculation. And I would have liked to have had the chance obviously to ask him those follow-up questions and all due respect to my colleagues that um, repeated his line. But, um, you know, he says that he did some some things internally to deal with it. And, and we have no details from those interviews, at least from the reporting of those interviews on who he sent it to. Maybe he wouldn't say, um, but, you know, they're not coming clean with this. And, and you, you got to understand his media tour not only followed those reports about the promise that he made and failed to keep to the first complainant, those media reports also followed a string of, of litigation by WBZ challenging uh, the Park District's denial of our requests for public records uh, that um, they don't want us to see, you know, and they don't want you to know how they handled this. There are a number of former lifeguards that are saying, as I'm sure you would agree, Ben, open the books. What are you hiding? and it's time to come clean. But their excuse is that it would hamper this investigation, an investigation that they've allegedly starved for resources. Yeah. By the way, Dan, welcome to the club. Before you uh, switch to Evanston, you know you've done your job as a reporter in this town when uh, Flax at City Hall ignore you and go to other reporters. I'm just telling you this as an old, like, old guy who's been around for a long time. The Daily <laughs> daily People never turned my calls. From the 90s into the O's, they like, they were, you know, they wrote me off as this weirdo for the, the reader uh, who cared about things that nobody else cared about, and they just ignore me. So it's so, to me. So you're in the snub club. You know? Yes the snub club when they go to other reporters it's like you did your job and they don't want to go to you which is ridiculous mike kelly you ought to be ashamed of yourself for sitting on it for six weeks and uh, mayor Lori life with this come on now we expected more from you to bring in the light and to be the the mayor of transparency and to allow this to happen uh, and not require mike kelly uh, to turn over uh, the evidence to the inspector general is absurd all right let's move over to my beloved hometown evanston i'm a proud graduate of evanston high school and i went to many of those beaches many times i am not surprised dan when i say this evanston is always trying to imitate chicago in the worst ways with the, their cockamamie tiff program they have in evanston which is almost as bad as the one we have in chicago and now you've uncovered evidence uh that when it comes to harassment by lifeguards it's uh pretty much the same thing in evanston as it is in chicago talk about the evanston side of this story okay um after we did the first story in april in chicago uh we got a lot of tips from a lot of former Chicago lifeguards, but also from some lifeguards in Evanston. Uh, we have a tip line, by the way, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna plug it. It's at investigations at WBZ.org. That's investigations at WBZ.org. It's a lot easier to remember than my first initial last name at WBZ.org. So we came up with investigations at WBZ.org and in that mailbox, uh, and personally I fielded uh, some uh, complaints from Evanston, from people who said that they worked at the beach and there was also a toxic misogynistic atmosphere there, that there were a number of cases uh, as serious as rape uh, by, again, people in higher up positions at the six beaches in Evanston against teenage girls and, and basically college age girls, uh, guys that were a little bit older, uh, abusing their authority over them. And uh, we took that very seriously. We understood and we, uh, that there was a petition that actually went to some city officials in Evanston a year ago. And again, for a year plus, there is silence. Uh, we obtained a copy of that petition and we interviewed uh, some of the people that organized the petition as well as other lifeguards who say they were sexually abused and harassed. Uh, at their jobs as beach workers in Evanston, whether it's lifeguards, you know, they also, ha you have to pay to go to the beach in Evanston, unlike Chicago. So there are other gate attendants and office workers at those um, beach houses. And uh, there, there are a number of them, 56 of them, in fact, 
signed the petition and they wanted a public apology and instead this was buried and kept out of the public eye until our story uh middle of last month and the reaction in evanston has been very very strong you know heads have rolled well, let's talk about the contrasting uh, reactions, responses uh, in Evanston compared to Chicago. We already heard about Chicago burying it and ignoring it uh, and then ignoring ignoring the reporter who broke the story and hoping to get a better, you know, uh, uh, easier questions from reporters who didn't break the story. Uh, so how has Evanston responded? You said heads of role. Give, give us a little more uh, specificity. Well, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, we've seen already one of the people that was uh, accused in the petition uh, had been continuing to work even after that petition uh, this year at the beaches, this this summer season at the beaches in Evanston. He quit, I think, a couple hours or so after the story uh, popped up on July 16th. Um, then we have the city manager, most significantly. She tries to... Um, place the HR director on paid administrative leave and, and says that she um, did not know about the petition at the time that it was filed. This is a city manager that makes in excess of a quarter of a million dollars a year. Uh, but now uh, she has agreed to resign and is trying to work out a separation agreement that will pay her 20 weeks of uh, her salary, of her, of her salary that I mentioned earlier. So close to $100,000 roughly and also guarantee a lot of secrecy and uh, protection from uh, public scrutiny of, of her actions in this. Um, but they did hire a um, outside law firm headed by uh, Julie Porter, former federal prosecutor and former Illinois legislative inspector general. And they're now working for the city of Evanston. And I believe from, from my sources uh, are already out there uh, trying to do what has been promised by the new mayor uh, newly elected Mayor Daniel Biss uh, and others say that this will be an independent and thorough uh, investigation that will look into all aspects of the situation for the beach workers of Evanston. As I said, dozens of them have, have accused um, their colleagues of, of sexual misconduct that victimized them. Uh, and uh, so let's talk about, uh, you mentioned Dan Biss. Uh, people Remember Dan Biss as a state senator, ran for governor in 2018, came in second to J.B. Pritzker in the Democratic primary. Uh, he has since moved on. He's now the mayor of Evanston. Uh, my hometown elected Dan Biss as its mayor. What was his response uh, when he uh, started following your stories? So it's very interesting. Uh, Daniel Biss was not the mayor when the petition was turned in. He was elected only earlier this year, and I believe he took office in May. So... Mm -hmm. We contacted, after we had the petition and did our interviews, uh, we contacted um, both Daniel Biss and the city manager's office. The city manager's office initially said that they responded absolutely adequately, that they were hamstrung by these young women who would not name names uh, to the extent that would allow them to investigate, that they thought that they had made the adequate changes like sexual harassment training um, and... Um, they ignore the fact, essentially, that, that the women continue to be frustrated, uh, as they told me in the story. Daniel Biss, on the other hand, the, issues a statement to me right before the first story ran, which is completely different from what the city officials are saying. He's saying, I'm looking into it. I've heard about it recently, but I'm not willing to say whether I think they did a good job or not. It's not clear to me yet. And after the story ran... Um, he and others at the city, uh, within a couple days, uh, hold an emergency meeting, closed door, a special session on a Saturday night, deep into the night, and they meet with the city manager, with the HR director. The HR manager and the city manager leave the room before the meeting is over, uh, so they were probably discussing their own roles in the matter and what, what discipline they might face. Uh, and then later on, uh, you know, they issue a statement that's much more conciliatory, that praises the women, that thanks them. And that and Biss basically has said that this is an institutional failure on the part of the city of Evanston. Um, and so I think you can contrast that, as you were indicating in your question, with Lori Lightfoot 
And, you know, both the Park District Board President, Avis Lavelle, and the CEO and General Superintendent, Michael Kelly, were appointed by her predecessor, Rahm Emanuel. But she is defending the Park District. She is defending Kelly. She dodged our questions about Kelly's delay. She dodged our questions about whether she supports Kelly continuing in the job as, a, as CEO of the Park District. Um, and... You can contrast that very sharply, I think, with uh, what's going on in your beloved hometown of Evanston. <laughs> My beloved hometown of Evanston, where I graduate as a young scholar from high school. Did I tell you I passed chemistry, Dan? I'm very proud of that. <laughs> Got a D, but it's still a passing, okay? Hey, we're uh, right but, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, Dan, great reporting. Uh, and again, uh, you're doing a great service uh, to uh, folks with your reporting about not just Evanston and Chicago. And it's, uh, I'll just close by saying this. I know you got to do that other interview. I have a lot of issues with appointed boards uh, in Chicago. Uh, and I've been hammering away at the school board. And the, and the line I always say is I've never seen an, a mayoral appointee at a board who dares to defy a mayor. And, and it's a lot of times you're called upon to defy the mayor, the mayor's not perfect. And when I see that the Avis Lavelle at the park district won't even respond to your calls, and she didn't even respond to the Sun-Times either, when they fo finally followed up on your reporting and did their own investigation, she didn't even respond to them. That's absurd. Like why even have officials if they're not gonna respond to legitimate investigations about wrongdoing in their departments. Do you have a response to that, Dan, before I let you go? It's been months of stonewalling and, um, you know, in response to your questions, yeah, about what the board is doing here, it's two di very different systems on each side of Howard. Park District is, you know, a sister agency, but like, as I, of city of Chicago, but as I like to say, if you're appointing the board and the whole, uh, and the president of the board and, and the general superintendent, then it's not really your sister unless you live in a country where you can tell your sister what to do every minute of her day. Um, you know, this the buck stops on the fifth floor of Chicago City Hall in the mayor's office as much as it does at the administration of the Park District. Um, Evanston, you know, it's a different situation. It's a city manager form of government, and it raises a different question when you see the, the city officials keeping this to themselves, allegedly keeping it out of the eyes of elected officials until it's in the media a year later. You see city officials saying that they did the right thing and the elected officials saying, you know, no, you didn't. Um, you know, it, it's a different question there of, okay, yes, you have professional public servants that are supposed to administer the city's business in a fair and impartial and apolitical manner, but are they really able to set their own policy and do their own thing and bury something of this magnitude for this long without the, the people's elected representatives being uh, brought into the conversation at least? Uh, you know, it's, these are both good questions, but different situations completely. And I do have to interview someone else, Ben, but thank you so much for having me on. And All if right. anyone has any tips, we're still working on this. Investigations at WBZ.org. Thanks Very so much. Good. Go to your phone call. That's Dan Mialopoulos. Uh, he already went three minutes too late. So get on that phone, Dan. Appreciate you being on the show. Uh, and I want to. My pleasure, my friend. Uh, it's Bucks and Six. <laughs> I told you, no basketball conversation, Dan. That's a different show at a different time. All right. All right. That's Dan Mialopoulos, uh, WBEZ Ace investigative report. He did a great job, ladies and gentlemen. He broke the story. I just want everybody to know. Uh, Dan broke the story, so <laughs> don't believe what you may read elsewhere. Danny broke it in April of 2021. I also want to thank Yvette Simpson. Man, that was a blast talking to Yvette Simpson. Uh, Delmarie Cobb, thank you so much for setting that up, and I hope she becomes a regular on our show. And, of course, I want to thank the man, the myth, the legend, the pride of joy of Alton, Illinois, without whom the show be possible. And as Dan and Yvette will tell you, back home in Alton, they call him Dr. D. Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everyone.